An atom exists as matter. Atom is what forms matter itself. The smallest part. The smallest part of matter is generally called molecule. You understand that? It's generally called molecule, the smallest part. When you say smallest, it means you continue to break down matter, break down matter, break down matter. Atom itself can be treated as matter by the smallest part, the smallest part that makes up matter. If they take apple now, apple is matter, B, and you continue to divide apple, cut, cut, it will get to the smallest part that you can no longer cut it again. Which means that that thing is still part of the matter, it is still matter, Abby. But it is the smallest of it that we call the atom. Do you understand that? Can I rub this part? Please try and be jotting some things because we might not have to be repeating them over and over again. Is that taken? I already gave you this in your notes. It's in your notes. I'm just writing it out again. But this aspect now is not in your notes, which we'll talk about soon. Now, what I'm saying is that, so the summary of my story is now, is that, let's look at it. So let's quickly look at the summary of my stories. Matter of two types. Matter. Matter is categorized as something that is pure or impure. So your atom is also part of matter. So something that is pure or what? Or impure. Something that is pure can be your elements, which are those things that we say make up your matter, and compounds. Is that taken? Your elements and compounds. The smallest part of your elements is the atom. These elements can come together to form molecules. Abby? So these guys are said to be pure as long as they are made up of discrete elements, the elements that make them up themselves. So, but the impure one is what we call mixtures. Is that taken? Is mixtures. So mixtures is like a combination of compounds. It is impure because it is not that useful. In chemistry, you talk about purity. If the composition of that substance is not the same, I'm talking about sodium chloride, which is salt. And when I want to test for all the elements that make up sodium chloride, I discover that hydrogen is there. Then that means this guy is not pure. So when you are looking at purity, does not mean something is dirty. There are some chemicals in the laboratory that you see that they show a blue color. The fact that it is blue in color does not mean it's not pure. Some will be red. It does not mean it's not pure. What is only telling you is that the composition, what I am made up of, is what gives me this color. So, if I'm talking about copper sulfates now, what are the elements you are expecting to see in copper sulfates? Copper, sulfur, and oxygen. Abby? But now, if you see nitrogen there, that means it is no longer pure. That means it is no longer copper sulfate alone. I hope you understand that. So, a compound is pure, but your mixtures are what? Impure. So, you look at your mixtures. A mixture of kerosene and ethanol. Oh, the gogoro, you mix your ethanol, you mix it with water. Is it, that, is it going to be useful? No. It can only be useful because you have diluted the ethanol. That's the only thing. But the composition of ethanol and uh, water might be different. So you have to look for ways to separate them. When you mix water and kerosene, can you still make use of that kerosene? No, because it has turned to something that is no longer useful, impure. Do you understand what mixture is now? So mixture is talking, what do you call an element? So probably let's define. Let's define them quickly. Quickly. An atom is defined, so you have to be fast, please. An atom is defined as the smallest part. An atom is defined as the smallest part of an element. Smallest part of an element that can take part in a chemical reaction. The smallest part of an element that can take part in a chemical reaction. Please don't get this wrong. 
I used to tell you this. So right, while elements, so right, while elements, while elements is the smallest part of a substance. While elements is the smallest part of a substance that cannot be splitted. You can't split elements. Is the smallest part of a substance that cannot be splitted into simpler units. When you break down an element, you form another element. Glory to God. So, I said that what? The smallest parts of a substance that cannot what? Be, be splitted into simpler units. To simpler units. There are over, there are up to 118 elements. So you can write that. There are up to 118 elements on the periodic table. So now let's look at the difference so that you understand the difference between atoms and elements. Now let's basically look at the difference. Atom, elements. I said there are up to like 118 elements. There can be up to like a thousands of atoms. But let's look at the difference. Which element is this? Eh? Which element is this? Which element is this? Are they the same exactly? They are not exactly the same. But are we talking about the same element? Yes. Now, this carbon is called atom of carbon. This is an atom. But the element is what? Carbon. For example, C6, H12, O6. How many elements do I have here? Eh? How many elements? We have three elements. Say no. We have three elements. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those are the three elements. Is that taken? No, no doubt about that. But how many atoms? That means the number of times you have that element. Do you get it? The total number of elements here, yeah, number of elements is three. But the number of atoms is what? Six plus 12 plus. You have atoms of hydrogen 12 times. You have atoms of oxygen six times. You have atoms of carbon six times. So the total number of atoms we have here is what? 24. Do you get that? You can see the difference. So when you want to address them, you address them as atoms of the elements. Because you don't really know the one you are talking about. Maybe it's carbon 12, carbon 14, carbon 16, carbon 13, isotopes. So you don't know. But something is similar, which is their what? Atomic number. This is 6, and this is also 6. Abby, the moment you change this, then you have changed the identity of that element. The moment you change that 6, you have changed the identity. So that's why we say that elements cannot be what? Further splitted into simpler units. So if you break it down and you get something like maybe the atomic number, you break this guy down, you get something like 4, and you get something like 2, you are talking about different elements entirely. Do you get that? The atomic number for carbon is 6. Which element has the atomic number 4? Beryllium. Are you talking about carbon? No. Which atom has the atomic number 2? Helium. So that is another element entirely. Do you get the point clear? So an atom forms the basics of every element. So I have atom carbon, which is what? Carbon atom of 12. So if I want to talk about this, in this place now, sodium chloride, I'll say I have sodium atom and what? Chlorine atom. Even though those elements, there are two atoms here, Abby, and there are two elements, right? But if I have, let's say I have CaCO3, I'll say I have 
calcium atom a bit, which is one mole. Carbon atom, one mole. How many moles of oxygen? Three. Three of it. But how many elements do I have? Just three. But the total number of atoms is five. And now those things are important when you start calculations too. They can say calculate the number of atoms present in a compound. You have to understand the concept. Aeons. Calculate the number of aeons. Calculate this, calculate that. You have to understand what they are saying. So looking at what we have here, you understand how your elements are formed. Then we now say that all these atoms come together to form what? Molecules. Abi. So these molecules, depending on the number of atoms that forms your molecule, we now have what we call, you know, we have ionic molecules. We have normal molecular compounds. So if with what we have here, we have um, mono, like I said, Abby. So I'm just doing a summary again of it. We have mono, we have di, we have tri, and we have what? Poly. So you already have that in your notes. And you can give examples of when you say monoatomic, made up of one atom, die, made up of two, and so on. So let's be fast. Now, when you are looking at mixtures, compounds, how do you form compounds? Compounds are formed from combination of elements. Is that taken? Compounds are formed when one or two elements are joined together. So that's how you form compounds. This is our compound now, made up of that building and this building. That is not chemistry related. So a compound is formed when what? One element and other elements are joined together. So you call it a compound. So, but most times your compounds are formed chemically, not physically. Is that taken? So a compound is a substance formed when one when two or more elements are joined together chemically. A compound is a substance formed when two or more elements are joined together what? Chemically. That's how you form a compound. Note, these elements, these elements can only be separated by chemical means. So you can't join sodium and chlorine together and you jump in between them and say, oh yeah, chlorine go this way, sodium go this way. I said that this, this was it called? These elements can only be separated by what? Chemical means. So you can only separate chlorine from sodium only by chemical method, not by physical method. So then another thing is that most compounds, right? Compounds, compounds usually have a property that is different. Compounds have property that is different from the properties of their constituent elements. Do you get that? Compounds usually have properties that are what? Different from their constituent elements. Do you know the properties of hydrogen gas? Or hydrogen itself? Do you know the properties of oxygen? Abby? But when it turns to water, they become something else. Hydrogen is a gas. Oxygen is a gas. Oxygen and hydrogen come together. They form liquid. Why didn't they form gas? I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Now, sodium is a metal. Chlorine is poisonous. If you take chlorine, you might... I don't know. God owns your life. But when you mix sodium and chlorine, what does it form? Salts. And you start feeding well. Think about all those elements. And think about the compounds they form. Compounds, the properties of carbon is entirely different from what you have in glucose. So when compounds are formed, they now have a property that is totally different from what the element itself has. Do you get that? So the fact that you bring an element and join it to another element does not mean that it will still have the same property that element has. When sodium chloride is formed, it turns to a brittle substance that just go crumpling. Abby, a brittle substance. 
that just go on crumpling. But if you look at carbon itself, carbon is a solid, Abby. Carbon is a solid. Carbon can form your graphite, and carbon can also form diamond. Abby, this same carbon. But how would it form diamond? That would it form graphite? Bonding. Abby, then bonding now changes structure. So when elements come together, they change their property totally. They change what they are totally. So sodium chloride now is an example. This one is an example. Water is an example. Oxygen gas and hydrogen gas, they come together and they give you liquid. Why? Some forces are now in play. So you will know about those forces later. You will know about them later. So let's just take it one after the other. Is that taken? So can you give examples of compounds? Eh? Examples of compounds. Oh yeah, as you are saying it, we're writing them. Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is generally called what? Table salt. Is that taken? So don't forget. We usually call it table salt. There are several salts, but it's the one that you usually use in your kitchen. I be your mommy has sent you ammonium chloride before. So that your cover kitchen going to be smelling like urine. <laughs> so the ammonium chloride I left here now. Some of you left it open and everything turned to water finish. So, but your sodium chloride is an example of a compound. Urea. Urea is a compound. Urea from your urine. Abby. Table salts. Urea. What's the formula for urea? Which other one? Please. Most times, the compounds, you don't know their formula. The fact that you don't know a formula does not mean that it's a mixture. But most times in mixtures, we don't really write formulas for them. There is no formula for mixtures. Sodium chloride and glucose, they mix together. What's the formula? Eh? Sophia, what's the formula? So if you mix sodium chloride and sugar together, will they give you any formula, any equation? No. They are just mixed together physically. You understand that? So most times in mixtures, there's, we don't represent them with chemical formulas. So if they say you should give three differences between compounds and mixtures, compounds, they are formed chemically. Mixtures are formed physically. Compounds are represented using chemical formulas. Mixtures cannot be represented using chemical formulas. Compounds are pure substances. Mixtures are impure substances. The constituents of compounds are different from the constituents of their elements. The constituents of mixtures are retained. I just gave you like four now. And they are from all the stories I've been talking about. I don't know if you get that. So now, aside urea, what other compound do you have? Eh? Topentine. What's the formula for topentine? So it's an hydrocarbon. H. Is this 16? So the. So what's that? Anthracene. Anthracene. This is naphthalene. Abby. So that's what you have. So that's your anthracene. That's naphthalene. Do you get that? So your benzene rings. We have talked about some of them. Your toluene. Your toluene. But don't let us take it too, too far. We are still talking about the basic things. So when you have grown to the level that, okay, you now know very well, then all these things become simple. There are a lot of compounds, a lot, a lot of chemical compounds. So, hmm? caustic soda. What's caustic soda? 
NaOH caustic soda. That's caustic soda, NaOH. <laughs> and that's why I said I will check because in the textbook he's C1016 but there might be there might be probably some double bonds in between you understand but there is no way because if we say C and A2N it's supposed to be C1020 Abby and if we say it is our kind it will be C10 H18 Abby so how we go C1018 I'm just leaving it for you first so it might be a ring structure as well. So we we'll look at that. So is that taken? There are thousands of compounds, thousands and no, 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 no. It's not. It says the same. Eh? Atrazine is the same as topentine. Topentine is that chemical you use to remove. Paints. So, is that taken? So, please don't let us drag back. So, for now, your urea, your table sorts, which other compound? So, for anyone you can represent the formula is your chemical compound, as long as you can represent the formula. So, this is urea, so table sorts, so, and caustic soda. So, this is called caustic soda. At least, those are the ones you should at least know. Caustic soda. Which other one? Eh? Slate slime, Abby. Calcium hydroxide, H2O. So let's leave that. We still have a long way to go. So all those ones are your compounds. Is that taken? Kerosene is your compound too. Petrol is a compound. So, but your crude oil is a mixture. So now let's look at mixtures. So what are mixtures? I hope you are following it step by step. And please don't create a complicated mind to learning chemistry. Chemistry is very, very wide, fine. And it can be very, very simple. Very, very simple. But if you complicate your mind, you might find it difficult. Esther, you want to study nursing, see right. You must be ready to learn. You must be ready. It's work, it's work. So work. Don't get tired. I gave you like 10 minutes to have your break. So, what is a mixture? Eh? Eh? So, a mixture is a substance formed. Formed by the combination of two or more compounds physically they don't react by the combination of two or more compounds physically and can be separated by physical means and can be separated by what? by physical means so that is what a mixture is. So you cannot represent a mixture with chemical formulas. Is that taken? When you get to a stage, all these definitions, we won't be having them again. So. Now, what are examples of mixtures? Your mixtures can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. Homogeneous means it exists in the same phase. Heterogeneous means it exists in different phase. Is that taken? So, your mixtures, examples of mixtures. Eh? Limestone. Limestone is a compound. Is that taken? Blood is a mixture containing different things. Urine is a mixture. Crude oil is a mixture. Is that taken? Oh, yeah, continue. Yes, it's a mixture. Carbonated drink. It has a, everything. Then, flood water. Flood or sea water. So, any one of the two. 
Sand is not a mixture. Your soil is a mixture. Your sand is basically SiO2. So it's what we represent as sand. That's a compound. Is that taken? Your sand is a compound. So soil, which other one? Eh? Which other one can you think about? Volcanizer solution. Volcanizer solution is also a mixture. So anything you combine together that does not really have a way to represent chemically. So they are said to be mixtures. Is that taken? So you people are talking too much there. Now, I already told you that your mixtures are what? Impure. But your compounds and elements are pure. Now, this mixture or matter that we have been talking about, so I want to rub this board. The matter exists in different states. So we have been on introduction since. So matter exists in different states. What are the states of matter? Eh? So basically they exist as solid, liquid, and what? And gas. So quickly let's look at it. States of matter. So when you're talking about the three major states of matter what that we talk about, they are the solid, the liquid, and the gases. So let's quickly look at the differences between these three states of matter. What are the things that differentiate the three states of matter? Majorly, what talk about them generally is their force of attraction. So we we'll look at those properties like their degree of movement. So their properties like the degree of movement. Movement. We look at their shape. We look at their volumes. The forces of attraction. And so on. Degree of movement, another thing you call that is entropy. Entropy. Degree of randomness or entropy. So when you look at your solid liquid, let's look at it pictorially. Your solids, they are all packed together. Is that taken? They are all packed together. So they only vibrate about their main position. But for your liquid, they have the ability to slide over one another. That's your liquid. But your gases, they occupy every available space. So let's now use this to differentiate them. To differentiate them. So when you are talking about solids, generally, solids usually have a definite shape. Is that taken? Solids, they are what? A fixed shape. So their shape is fixed. But these liquids, they don't have any fixed shape. No fixed shape for gases as well. Is that taken? So if I take the head of JP and I put the head of JP on, on GDZ, Will JP look like GD? Eh? Eh? Oh because GDZ has a shape, JPZ has a shape. So they are solid. But if I take GD's blood out and I take JP's blood out, which is liquid, can you tell me the one that belongs to GD or the ones that belongs to JP without carrying out any tests? No. Because they don't have a particular shape. If you bring water from a cup, you pour it in a bowl, it will take the shape of that bowl. Abby, if you pour it in a basket, <laughs> it will go away. Abby, so, but if you take a, if you take water now, you put it in freezer, you put it in freezer, and you put it in a cup. When it freezes and you bring it out of the freezer, what happens to that water? It will take the shape of that cup. Even if you remove it from the cup and you put it in a very big bowl, it will still take the shape of the cup. Abby. So your solids, they usually have a definite shape. 
But your liquids don't have a definite shape. They only take the shape of the containing vessels. Do you get that? But your gases, those ones, they occupy every form of available space. Is that taken? Gases occupy every available spaces. How about volume? Your solid have a fixed volume. The volume is fixed. Liquid also has a fixed volume. Why gases, they don't have a fixed volume? Do you get that? 20 liters of liquid. That's a fixed volume. 20 liters. So, if I take my water now, pour it in a keg, it will be taking shape of that keg. It will occupy the volume of that keg. Then when it's filled to the brim, I can no longer introduce water. But if you continue to introduce gas, the gases that are there before they will escape, then it continues like that. So the gases always want to look for a way to occupy every available spaces. Do you get that? So there's no one particular volume for gas. So, but for liquid and solid, definitely if, I, if you put something that it starts to fill it. We said available space is what we call the volume, Abby. So if I continue to load solid here, it will get to a state that I won't be able to load the solid again, Abby. But if I continue to load liquid as well, it will get to a state that I can no longer add more liquid. But continue to introduce gas, they will just be moving everywhere. I hope you understand that. But except you now have a container that can contain that gas, and you measure the volume by the volume of that container. So you use the volume of the container to measure the volume of a gas. Do you get that? So that's what you get. Now, when you're talking about force of attraction, the force of attraction in solid is very, very great. So there's a strong force of attraction within the molecules of solid. I hope you're writing on